Hello everyone, how are you doing? And welcome to another episode of the Dr. Will Show, where we have the discussions that inform, entertain, and empower educators to be the change. I'm your host, Dr. Will, and today I am here with Sequoia Blodgett. How are you doing, Sequoia? I'm good, how are you? Thanks for having me. Quite well, thank you for being a guest on the show. See, you know, you first came on my radar from Ayana, you know, listening to her podcast. And I said, wow, there's some dope gems here. So <laughs> you know, as I did some more research about you, I, I was like, I got to get her on the show. Not thinking, you know, I can, you know, because I'm looking at you, you know, interviewing people from Insecure, <laughs> and Mon Rucker from Greenleaf. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not at that level yet. <laughs> I'm accessible if, if, if the, it's a friend of a friend shoot you through <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome but, but you know as i again did more research i just became more enamored by what you're doing and so i, I reached out and wanted to have you on the show uh you are a very fascinating individual and so uh, again welcome on the show and people today we're going to be talking about putting in the work and so will you introduce yourself yeah, I'm Sequoia. I am. I founded a couple companies. So I'm the founder of 7AM, which is a personal development ed education platform. I'm also the tech editor for Black Enterprise. And I am launching a new show called Commas, which is a web series surrounded urban Black, not necessarily Black, I won't say Black, so urban tech news, but told in an interesting and cool way. Awesome, awesome. So who is Sequoia Blodgett and what actually gets you out of bed in the morning? It's interesting because I work remote, so a lot of times I'm in the bed a lot. <laughs> but um, I love content. I love to create content. I love to tell stories. I love to bring people's stories to fruition and to light. A lot of the times with Black Enterprise, those stories that we report on wouldn't necessarily get told by a, a New York Times or a Fortune or what have you. So I like to gather those stories and bring those stories to Forefront. Um, additionally, creating content, making them interesting, because a lot of people don't like to read. A lot of people want to have their content easily digestible, and that's something that I'm really good at. So that's what I get excited about. And you're doing so many amazing things in the space. Uh, the BE Code, I've checked that, pa that podcast out. Uh, awesome. You used to be a music director, right? I was. I was. Uh, now you are at BE, be, you know, blackenterprise.com, Silicon Valley tech editor. How did you make that change? You know, please speak to, you know, what happened to make you move into another direction. Yeah, I mean, our industry, so I was directing music videos and our industry was getting disrupted heavily and I felt it really, really strongly. My mentor was one of the biggest directors in the industry, and he was directing jobs with Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, Britney Spears, just all these like massive pop artists. And seeing his budgets get hit and cut, and knowing that I was still coming up in the game to get my, to the level of where he was, I was like, if he's not sustaining, like, what am I gonna do? And I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Steve Stout just came out with a company recently. It was released today or announced today on Black Enterprise. Um, United Masters, which is essentially disrupting the record industry. So I think that I saw that ahead of time, and I'm glad that I jumped ship when I did, because it's really hard to sustain when you don't have the budgets that you need. So I ended up working at an all-girls entrepreneurship and tech boot camp, and these kids were like the kids of like YouTube CEOs, Google CEOs, and they would come in on Monday like, why am I here? Like, why did my parents sign me up for this? And literally by Friday, I have like a full blown like mock up of a product with like brand identity and be mock pitching to venture capitalists as to if they would invest in these ideas. And I was like, what is this? I'm from the Bay. And I had no idea that that existed on the magnitude that it did specific to Silicon Valley because I'm in the East Bay. And in proximity, they're only like 30 minutes away from each other. But if you don't know, you don't know, right? So essentially after that, I moved out. While I was in that program, somebody introduced me to Draper University. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'm gonna try it, I'm gonna go out there and see you know, 
what it's about. So I moved out to the Bay Area on a whim, not really knowing exactly what I was getting myself into, and went through the seven-week entrepreneurship boot camp with this crazy, zany, billionaire venture capitalist, <laughs> and really just got to understand venture capital from the perspective of Silicon Valley. And I decided to start a company and it was, I was going through a lot of relationship stuff at the time. And I was like, Hey, they've got Tinder and Bumble and all these apps that put you in relationships, but like, we're the apps that keep you in relationships. So <laughs> I literally created this prototype, found a co-founder within like the seven week time span and pitched it. And Tim was like, cool, I'll invest. And so all of a sudden I had inherited a Delaware C Corp which <laughs> I didn't even know what that was seven weeks prior to, right? So it was just this really, really, really fast journey. I stayed on as an entrepreneur in residence. And from that, I got picked up, the sh a show got picked up around it on ABC Family called Startup You because people were really curious about the space. And it's a trendy thing right now, like tech and startup. So built out that company to the point where I, I was advising students on the show, or entrepreneurs rather, on the show. And I got to the point personally was where I was like, well, I obviously know how to build a prototype. I obviously know how to validate with the customer, but I'm not sure logistically that I want to run this company or I'm the right person to run this company. And not so much so that I didn't feel like I had the skill sets, but more so that there was just a lack of knowledge in terms of running. I, I technically have a media tech company, right? So the knowledge in terms of sales and how to generate revenue that weren't, like I wasn't completely dependent on venture dollars. So I went and worked for Black Enterprise so I could get some insight. I'm like, they've been around for 47 years. They must know what they're doing. And they've never been venture backed. So yeah, that's how it all got started. Awesome. And I'm glad you bring that up because I was watching a video of Gary V. And he was talking about how, you know, one of his greatest issues with Silicon Valley is just a bunch of cats out there just trying to raise funding and funding just to get to the next round and not actually building a business. Right. Right. And as the founder of 7am, you know, please speak to the importance of actually putting in the work and building a profitable business. Yeah, it's interesting. So we were revenue, well, not revenue positive because we had an initial investment, investment, but we were generating revenue from the day that we actually launched the company. So for me, it was something that he invested in because he knew that there was product and market fit. So he knew that there would be revenue generated from the company. A lot of people come to Silicon Valley as like kind of the new gold rush. So they're like, oh, I can go out there and raise millions and millions of dollars and create this company. And if it fails, oh, well. And like, that's really not the story anymore. A lot of investors don't want to touch your company unless they know that you found product market fit, which is essentially your product has gone to the market and people are paying for your product. And so if you've done that and you've done that well, a lot of investors will come on for scale, which is essentially growing the company. But before that, unless you've had like an extensive track record as an entrepreneur, or you've had, you know, a company that you may have exited or, or been an early on the early founding team or an early employee or something that shows that you have, you know, you're de-risked, then it's not likely that you're going to get any type of venture investment. So you're out there and I'm going to say it, you're killing the game. Uh, <laughs> What are your rules for success? So my rules for success is to try it. And if you fail, fail fast. Like don't spend a lot of time on something that's not working because you can burn a lot of energy, a lot of resources and a lot of time. I mean, with Tim's initial investment, we were able to build out the product, take it to market and then start to generate customers. So if I didn't see that start to happen really quickly, I would have, pivoted or iterated the product fairly quickly, like within the probably I would say three to five months. And that's something that I totally focus on is failing fast and like knowing when to like shift gears, especially being in the Valley. You can't really sit on a product for too long because you're just not going to get that traction that you need in order to succeed. And then what people don't realize is, is when you run out of money, your business is dead. So, so 
know, at the end of the day, you have to be willing to fail really, really fast. So I want to throw this out there to you. There's a lot of individuals out there, you know, whether they're, they're looking at you and they listen to a Yana and they're excited about taking that next step, making that move. But for some reason, they're stuck and they're, and they're not moving. So, uh, so what do you say to them to just get them just to take that first step to make something happen? So it's fear, right? So psychologically, a lot of us have very fear-based, um, I guess, internal beings where we don't want to move because we're f- afraid of failing. We're afraid of judgment. We're especially in the black community. I mean, a lot of what we go through in terms of growing up, everybody's like, you've got to succeed. You've got to succeed. You've got to succeed, which is not necessarily the case. Most people who are successful have failed a multiple of times before they actually hit that one success that like elevated them to the point of you actually knowing who they are. Right. So before that they failed a good, a good amount of times. And I think that people have to just be willing to take the risk. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone going out and creating a business and being a CEO a founder running that business is not for everyone. And it is perfectly fine to work at a corporation and get a paycheck and like have work-life balance. Like that is totally fine. So it just depends on what your tenacity is and like how you're physically structured and how you're mentally structured. And that'll be contingent upon if you're cut out for entrepreneurship. And I like to say this, like if, if that's something that you want to do, then you just have to go and take that risk. And if it doesn't happen, you have to take another risk and another risk and another risk, right? So it's all about risk taking throughout your entire journey. Mm. So a couple of months ago, I had a, a conference reach out to me to ask me to podcast from their conference. And I, I was really excited, you know, because I'm like, they're going to be paying everything, take, you know, hooking me up. And I was like, this is a big move for the conference. But as I thought about it, I was like, well, I don't know if that's the right move for me in terms of where I want my, where I want my podcast to go. So ultimately I turned that down. You can't be everything to all people. Right. So, and you can't accept every offer that comes your way. So what are your guidelines for actually saying no to opportunities? I say, um, I say no more than I say yes, because I get inundated with stuff. And to be honest, like they're only 24 hours in a day. And once something gets pushed off to the next day, then that becomes more that I have to deal with. Right. So I make sure that there's a value add, whether that be a monetary value add, whether that be a brand add, there has to be something that's adding to the bigger picture or else it's not worth my time. I just think that I can go and obviously contribute and and go through the whole process, right? But you just burn a lot of energy, you burn a lot of time, and you burn, like, your mental stability gets off (laughs) when you can't, like, find that balance, right? So I just vet whatever it is that comes to me, and I make sure it's in alignment with the brand. And if it makes sense with the brand, then I may or may not say okay, depending on if there is some type of monetary compensation attached to it. And that's essentially how I live my life, right? Because there has to be, you have to put value onto yourself. Like if you don't value yourself, some, no one else is going to value you. And I feel like when you go into the market, everybody wants something. They want, 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 want. But you can find out really quickly how serious somebody is and how much they value you when they put a monetary dollar behind it. And so that's what I've been doing is I've been like, hey, like if you're interested, then this is what you got to do to get it done. And, and if it makes sense, it makes sense. But it ultimately has to be in alignment with the brand first. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm glad you you brought that fee up. Right. Uh, because I know a lot of us out there would do certain things in the beginning to get our names out there, to get exposure. Oh, yeah, I'll do that for free. I'll do that for free. And I did that myself. And then I got to a point to where I said, oh, (laughs) no, uh, I need a check. And and from there, things have been, you know, working. So even now, you know, I get paid to write articles for AirTech magazines. How will someone know? And, And I know you talk about, you know, I need, you know, you need to value your time and make sure people show up to value your time. But how, how will someone know when they've reached that point 
to where free is no longer an option for them. Yeah, when you're like inundated with stuff, like when everybody's trying to get you for something, then you know that you have to put a price point on it, right? Like at that point, you have to differentiate, okay, what's actually worth my time and what actually makes the most sense. I'll go back to when I was directing music videos. Like in the very, very beginning, obviously you're building a reel, you're getting your, your name out there, your work out there, right? So I worked for free for a long time. And soon I would start to get, you know, different requests from people. You almost see the, the brand shift because the visuals will shift, the quality of content will change. So you might have like somebody who's like a random artist who's an independent artist, like hit you up for something versus like a Warner Brothers Records or Atlantic Records. And obviously they have a budget, but like with my mentor, some of the stuff I was doing for free for him because he was working with those big artists and those big names and that's who I wanted to be attached to. So I feel like in the tech space, it's a similar layout. Like you're going to see like your tech crunch disrupts and like your Afrotech tech connects or what have you. And maybe those have a higher weight for you. So you're like, okay, I'll speak for free for those conferences versus like, I don't know, some mom and pop shop who wants you to do something with their new technology at their, you know, panel that they set up one weekend. I don't know. But like that type of stuff I won't do because it's just, it's not worth the time. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm glad you just brought Afrotech up because it's something that I don't think a lot of people know what it is. So uh, I've definitely been following on, on Twitter and seeing all the things and wish I could go. And hopefully one day that'll be the case. Uh, but would you please uh, sort of educate people a little bit on what that conference is? So yeah, there's a bunch of different tech conferences. So we have ours, which is Tech Connect, and there's Afrotech, there's Tech Inclusion, there's, there's a ton of them, there's TechCrunch Disrupt, and each of them has their own kind of brand. So specific to Afrotech, it's like more millennial based. It's like younger. It's, it's very, it has a cool factor to it. So when you go, you know, there's like DJs in the waiting room. There's like, you know, like Bozma, uh, St. John was over at Uber, like wrapped Cardi B. So it's like a whole different vibe in terms of, you know, the different tech conferences. So yeah, that one just happened this past weekend and they had an amazing turnout. Chameleonaire came out and displayed his new app, Combos. Um, Jesse Williams did uh, Liberty, which is his new app. It's like a trivia app game. Uh, Keelani, or Kaylani came out and she has a new app called Flora that uh, Backstage Capital invested in. So I think that depending on what you're looking for and depending on, you know, where you feel like your sweet spot is, there's a conference out there for you, definitely. So for all of the things that you're out here doing, how do you know when an idea or something isn't working and it's time to pivot? That's a good question. So I would give it three to five months. Most things don't take that long. Like you're gonna go and you're gonna do what's called serving your audience. So you're going to actually go and talk to your audience. A lot of people, and this is interesting because I find this in the black community a lot, they don't want to talk about stuff. And I mean, this was an entertainment industry thing too, is like, oh, I'm writing this new script. I can't tell you about it. Or, you know, I'm building this new app. I can't tell you about it. That's like the absolute wrong way to go. Like you have to validate your concepts immediately or else again, you're wasting time, you're wasting energy and you're wasting resources. So I recommend that when you're about to start a product or a project or build what ultimately will become a company, that you go to your audience first. Like you can do as little as a landing page and you can put up, hey, Building out, so just for example, with combos, which is our uh, commas, which is the new web series that I'm working on. Before I created a full show, I went, created a teaser and a sign up page and like said, hey, if you want access to the full episode, you have to leave your email address. That's enough for me to know does the market even care? Because if they care, then they're going to leave their email address and then I'll start to see like who exactly is interested in this versus creating a full episode, putting in all of this production time, 
money, energy, effort, and then nobody watches it, right? So that's the way to do it. You have to test and validate the market first. And as soon as you do that, then you have an audience that you've baked in based off of that test. And then you can start to feed that audience. Wow. I love that. And what I really love about technology and particularly with the internet is it truly democratized people's abilities to actually produce content and put it out there. So now right. you, don't have, you don't have to work, wait for some company to sign you up and dis distribute it. You can say, boom, no. here's my website, here's YouTube, here's Vimeo. I got it out there. So uh, you need to give me a link to that so I can check out. Absolutely. I mean, look series. at in her, in her uh, show Insecure, that, that's exactly how it started. She brought Awkward Black Girl to YouTube and basically built an audience around that. And then she was able to take it to HBO and HBO Bit, right? So you got to look at it from that standpoint. Most people, especially high value, if you're talking about a Google, a Facebook, a what have you, if you're looking for somebody to acquire a company, you want to build a certain amount of traction first. And that's the same business model for a TV show. That's the same business model for a product, whatever it is, build up the traction and then go pitch to investors and then go pitch to networks, and then go pitch to companies. That's when you actually have some value add. Awesome. So we've all heard about the lack of diversity in Silicon Valley, but I wanna ask you about the importance of folks of color actually creating their own table. You know, I had Bari A. Williams on the show, and, and while she talked about inclusion, she said, we need to start owning and building and building our own companies, our own institutions. So how important is it for people of color for us to create our own opportunities within the tech space? I believe heavily in that, but here's my thing. I think that you have to build something strongly first, right? So my point being is, yes, we should create our own, but we don't have the resources. Like, a Facebook, a, a Google, like in terms of like money. So <laughs> at some point I'm going to hit a wall that's going to be like, Hey, I need money. I got to play, pay employees. I got to, you know, build software. I got to do whatever I need legal fees. I got to do all of these things. So it's cool if I'm sitting here building a company, but if, I don't have any money to push that forward, then I'm hitting a wall. And the way that you get that money is purely, purely by numbers. So people have to be involved and engaged for other people to be excited to give you money. So I think a lot of times we get like very discouraged because we're like, oh, we can't raise venture or we can't do X, Y, Z. Well, if you think about how Blavity set up their company, before they took venture, they made sure that they had a, a massive amount of users before they went over and said, hey, like they totally de-risked the company. And at that point, investors were like, all right, cool. Like we already see that this is going to something. Even if you think about from like on the lower uh, totem pole, not necessarily a huge company, but like social media influencers. The reason they're able to leverage and bring in their own money to their own brands is because they're numbers. So I say, do what you can do to the lowest extent with the least amount of resources possible that's going to bring you the most numbers that you can actually get. And once you do that, then you'll start to see excitement around it. But I feel like a lot of the times we go after things and we're like, hey, you need to invest in this. And they're like, why? <laughs> so, so yeah, I just, I say, of course we should own it. We should build it and they will come. That's not necessarily true. You got to make sure you have something that people want and then they will actually come and then you can go get that investment. Right. So before we go, what is your call to action for those individuals who find themselves at a rut in their life and don't know what that next step is? It's literally so funny because I just posted something about that on my Facebook yesterday. 
And what I've realized about myself is anytime I get to a point where I'm like super frustrated, I don't know what I'm doing. Something's just like, oh my God. And like, just out of my control, at least it feels like out of my control, I ask questions. But you have to ask the right questions. Because once you start to ask questions and you're asked the right questions, there are answers. There's answers for everything. Anything you're going through currently, you are not the first person to go through it. I promise you that. So I find myself a lot of time YouTubing, Googling, asking friends, asking peers, and just really like being vulnerable. I think a lot of the times with us specifically, we're like, we tend to kind of take on too much and then we don't, we let that sit with us versus like being outward and like sharing our vulnerability. But people are willing to help. Like they, they want to help and they have answers, but you have to be willing to put yourself out there and ask. Mm. And that's uh, difficult. Like I'll be honest with you. I really don't care because the, the worst thing someone can say to me is no. And that really means yeah. nothing. Right. So that's why, you know, I can ask Ayana, hey, you know, because I reached out to her first and then she came on the show. She had a good time. And then that's why I can go to her and say, hey, will you ask Sequoia to be on my show? Right. Uh, and then I'll get on Twitter all the time. And, and I reached out to J.K. Hoey. She was like, yes, let's do this. And I'll ask, him, you know, hey, I'll ask folks because they can always ignore the tweet or they can say no. But I'm going to yeah. ask because I really want them on my on my show because one, I want to have certain types of com conversations that enrich me intellectually, but I want right. to be able to put out content for, you know, my, my fan base, those educators who are really looking to better themselves and push themselves forward. Mm -hmm. So it's awesome. Man, I, well, I, will, I will also say this too is Sometimes it's not asking for something. Sometimes it's asking for help or advice. Right? So, for example, I have this friend who is, he created this blockchain company. He's doing really, really well, has closed a lot of deals, and is a very busy man. But, like, a, like we met each other when he was in Boost BC, which was another accelerator through Draper. And we'll link up every couple months, and we'll just talk about what's going on. And so even with commas, I pitched it to him and I was like, hey, I'm thinking about the same commas, but like, is it too controversial? Like, is, are people going to get it? Da, 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 da. And then he was like, yo, just do it. You know what I'm saying? So just asking for feedback, I think sometimes is equally as important as asking for, you know, somebody, I don't, I mean, always ask for what you want is what it comes down to. <laughs> That's what I would say. I hear you. I hear you. Thanks again. Sequoia, for being a guest on the show. This was, I'm telling you, this is a highlight for me. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're the, people, you don't understand. Y'all, but you will find out when you watch this podcast, the video cast, you listen to it, which is going up on iTunes and SoundCloud. Please review, subscribe. Uh, and I'm going to put this on all my social media channels. You'll understand why I wanted Sequoia on the show. All right. So, right. people. You welcome. So people, as always, invest in you, edu, peace. Beautiful.